investigate what is actually going on under the hood to get their body and vibrant self back. Debbie shared her personal story in her book, Life is Not a Race, It's a Journey, and created the Holistic Method Manual and Workbook. So she's been a host of the Low Carb Athlete Podcast for 10 years. She's a 30-year personal trainer and coach. She is a, a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner and a nutritional therapy practitioner. She is a triathlete and a run coach and a metabolic efficiency specialist. So everyone, please welcome Debbie Hodge. Turn 50 in November. So I'm all about improving the aging process and help share some tips and tricks today that don't cost anything. Some do, but trying to share with you some great ways you can improve your health and improve the, your life every day. So I created the holistic method. We'll go over the eight elements today and warning. I tried to do this in 50 slides, I did not. Uh, I make everything now into an ebook. So not only will you have this presentation, you have a nice little ebook I'll give you the link to that has all this in it that I have a great person that puts it all together. Because as you'll learn about me, I had the philosophy is more is better. <laughs> I wrote myself to chronic stress disease, I say, metabolic chaos. So my new philosophy I try to go by less is more. <laughs> That doesn't always happen like today. The slides, I still had to have some slides. So we've got the timer and I'm already down one minute. So just a little bit about me. As Autumn has shared, I, my husband's not here. I didn't allow him to come in. But he is with me on the cruise. It's our 15th wedding anniversary. I met him when I was 35. And he won out to, uh, I just thought of this story. Uh, I had an interview with U2. At the same time I met him, I was second runner-up to going on tour with U2 to train uh, Adam Clayton. And so then I met my husband, like, better opportunity. Yeah. I met my life partner, my all-in-one best friend. We do everything together. And I'll add in here, we went to uh, San Diego in 2020, July. We moved there full-time from Seattle, rainy Seattle. I found kind of thriving in the outdoors quality of life move, we call it. Everyone else was moving away from California for various reasons, and we moved to California. So I'm in North San Diego, outside of Solana Beach now, and loving life, and as we'll find out, one of my eight elements is happiness, and I found out that I wasn't as happy as I am now after I moved. So as I said, I kind of have a problem with learning. <laughs> I'm always trying to find new things. I started as a personal trainer 25, well, now it's been, uh, I guess, 30 years, somehow, that I could never help people just training them twice a week, 30 minutes, 45 minutes an hour. It didn't really work. So that led me down the path of going into nutrition, as well as I was doing Pilates and yoga and everything else. Metabolic efficiency testing teaches people how to burn fat. Before we know all we know now, I was doing... Metabolic efficiency testing in 2005. Uh, got into holistic lifestyle coaching, and I work part time now for Ben Greenfield doing coaching for him as well as my own coaching business. But really found that there's so much more to being fit and healthy on the outside from just exercise, as we know, low carb, keto, carnivore, whatever you call it, a nutrient dense, proper human diet is where we want to start, build that foundation. But what if there's other stuff going on? that you're missing, that you still aren't thriving every day. So we're gonna go into that a little bit, honey. So my purpose and mission is to help other people avoid going through what happened to me. I was doing all the right things. I was doing low carb, keto, metabolic efficiency training as a, I competed high level in Ironman's top of my age group races for many years. I was doing low carb and fasted workouts probably like 2007, 2008. Well, I haven't raced since 2012. It's been 10 years. I broke myself down. I burned myself out. Even though I was doing low carb, I was exercising, I was doing all the right things. But I still gained 30 pounds in a few months after doing my best Ironman times in Ironman Hawaii. Did a marathon just because I was off training, off season. But I still created metabolic chaos. We'll talk about that. A little bit, but saw my book. I shared my story. It just felt like there was a need to share my story. What happened to me? Because fill in the blank. Whatever you're doing too much of, chronic stress impacts all the stuff that we do. 
even if you exercise and eat low carb, it still will impact your blood sugar. It will still impact your sleep, your digestion, everything. So that's why I kind of came up with the holistic method. Some of my lessons learned, less is more as I said, the Goldilocks effect, I'll talk about that right amount, that dose of every good stressor. We'll talk about what hormesis is. This is the right amount for you. You are an individual, you are unique. That's a big part, variation, n equals one experiment. A big part we'll talk about is positive mindset. I know some other people talk about that too this week. Self-care, I said, sorry, in the book. <laughs> self-care and self-love, and I said this when COVID started, really loving yourself enough. It means you're taking care of yourself, loving yourself enough to do all that. So positive mindset, red flags, listening to those, learning how to push pause, reset that. Do it to our computer all the time, do it to ourselves more. With that control alternate delete in your computer, you got to do it to ourselves. Life is a journey, not a race. As I said in my book, I was doing too much and led myself down this path, which is now kind of my purpose and passion to help other people. And again, the aging. I can't stand people say, I'm too old, I can't do that. Excuse, right? We can change the way we eat, exercise, move, how we take care of ourselves at any age. It's never too late. So improving the aging process by embracing the changes that we have, what I've really learned a lot about. Especially as I watch my parents age, they're having all these health problems. My dad's using a walker because he can't walk, so he hurt his back because he doesn't do any strength work and all this stuff. It's really hard to see the choices people make, but we can choose to do that. So again, more is not always better. Sometimes less is more, we'll learn a lot. So if you're feeling stuck, take some notes. You might feel some things resonate with you. You all have these notebooks that hopefully you have your pen in hand. Write those things down. One of the things that we do in our coaching program is creating tiny habits. And this is in my slides ebook that I wrote. But there's a gal who uses Eliza who has great tiny habits, how to create them. So it's anchor moment, a tiny new behavior, instant celebration. We can talk about that another time this week if you want. But really, all this stuff you learn can be so overwhelming when you go to conferences. Like, where do I start? Where do I begin? So, you know, maybe after this seminar, you pick one thing that I'm going to take action on now, not trying to do all this stuff at once. All right, the first of the eight elements is nutrition. Now, I knew I was speaking with after Maria, who I knew she'd talk about protein. What we eat, when, how, and why is really important. So, not just doing keto, low carb, carnivore, nutrient dense diet. It's eating real food that balances your blood sugar. But the when, a lot of people talk about the intermittent fasting windows. That's another seminar. How we eat, we'll talk a little more on the digestion section. But why you eat, I think is an important part we need to all think about. So, what to eat. I like to go into what I've done with clients is called personalized nutrition. Kind of look at a little bit how it's that N equals one experiment. Look at your background, look at your ancestors, look at your lifestyle habits, look at your sleep and your stress. There's so much to look at to figure out what works for you. A big part of nutritional therapy is we look at how does that food make you feel? That might be a great low carb, metabolically efficient food that balances your blood sugar or not. What does it do? Does it give you satisfy your cravings? Do you have fullness? Are you feeling energized? So this is a chart I give clients. It's a metabolic typing diet, but I like to use it just to do a check-in. How do you feel? How's your mindset afterwards? And then I use a nutritional therapy three-day food log looking at symptoms. I use a nutritional therapy assessment questionnaire kind of signs and symptoms. So it's looking at how foods make you feel. So taking that Nutrisense or CGM that you're wearing, Put that with it as well. Looking at genetics, they give us a lot of insights too. Some people can't tolerate as many saturated fats. So looking at your genetic report, there's strategy in the Dr. Ben Lynch, a great book to read if you like reading Dirty Genes by Dr. Ben Lynch. Has a strategy and report. Genetic gene is free. You can find out your detox methylation data if you have a 23andMe or Ancestry DNA report. You can upload that raw data into that program. And there's many, many genetic programs out there. My DNA is the new one I just talked to. 
DNA of it. So you can kind of find out that's one of the charts on the side picture there of what came out for my results. I'm very carb intolerant. I started doing low carb, as I said, back 15 years ago, because I, I react to a lot of food. <laughs> I've been sick for yesterday, ate something in the scrambled eggs that I shouldn't have. So, you know, I'm, I'm very reactive, but everyone's different. I know this information just gives me some insight how to eat, what to eat, but it's also listening to how my body feels. One thing Maria talks about, and a lot of others we've talked the last few years about more protein. I think it's interesting how we went from you know high carb diet we thought we were being healthy to low carb doing you know low fat, no fat is what I always did. You know I survived in college on popcorn and rice and chicken from Costco, and I thought I was so healthy and eating vegetables all the time. But we forgot about the the protein. So I'm glad people are talking about protein. I trying to get more protein and I don't know if anyone else talked about this but we can look at this another time how much protein to have a day and how to space it out if you ever do your macros it's really hard to get enough protein in a day you have to really sit down pause and calculate it out because you can't do OMAD and eat all that protein you can't do a 16-8 intermittent fast and really eat enough so it's hard to figure out when is appropriate to do fasting that's kind of more the first line working with the coach to figure out what works best for you. But a lot of suggestions are like Dr. Gabrielle Leon, having one gram of protein per pound of your goal body weight. But that's a lot of food. Like we eat protein because it fills us up and makes it satiated and you're not having those sugar cravings. But having 20 to 40 grams every three to four hours doesn't really work if you are <laughs> doing extended fasting. So that's something to think about. But how much to get in, and that's why I like bone broth. Uh, but focusing on longevity, I said, is my goal. That's my back flexing in Hawaii last month for a picture. But just the importance of eating more protein and lifting weights. I know we've got a couple great seminars coming up on getting stronger, lifting weights. But as Maria talked about eating nutrient-dense foods, I just started eating red meat this cruise 2019. I've always been kind of an animal-phobic eating <laughs> Me, I thought chicken and fish were okay. They weren't from animals. <laughs> Bacon was from flowers. But this cruise 2019, I started testing it out because everyone at my table was eating just protein and no vegetables. I'm like, what the heck is wrong with you people? And then I realized I felt way better. For me, N equals one, if I ate just protein. But I still, I'm not in liver soup and the raw organ meat, oysters. I'm pretty picky. But this is a great list of nutrient-dense foods, and then kind of the next level that my friend Brad Kearns did. I did a podcast with him recently. Okay, so nutrition tips on here. Just to give you a quick rundown, they'll move on. But menu pause, my friend Dr. Anna Kabeca has a great new book out. It has a five different food plans. There's six days, great variations. Nutrisensor levels is a CGM program. You get feedback. Does anyone wear an aura ring, whoop band? Yay, so we've got some, that's a huge metric. We'll talk a little bit. Again, I'll probably have to do this seminar in three different segments because I'm already over my time of five minutes per topic. But uh, the aura ring, heart rate variability, I could do an hour seminar on that. Heart rate variability is huge to find out if you're reactive to foods you're eating. Your heart rate variability will drop, lowers, not good. Heart rate variability is a great measurement of your stress, recovery, repair, but a lot of other information you can get from that. And if you just if you don't have aura ring, you can use a Bluetooth heart rate monitor. Okay, nutrition hacks. I call them stacks, biohacking stacks, putting things. I won't touch on this too much, but you know, strengthening your vagal nerve. We'll talk more in the digestive section. And essential oils, I, we were just talking about earlier, are big tricks. Apple cider vinegar, Ben Bickman has some information in his book about apple cider vinegar. This is one of my little secret drinks that I like to have, having some apple cider vinegar and water. So again, I'm rushing through this because I've got a lot, and they're all on the slides. Your ebook will have to. So exercise, I'm not gonna talk about so much exercise. I know we've got our other coach here talking about exercise this week. But what is the best type of exercise for you? There's <laughs> one that you will do consistently. Not everyone I've learned as a personal trainer for years wants to drop down and give me 10 burpees. 
So I'm not going to make my client do box jumps and burpees if they don't like that and their body doesn't move like that. So figure out what exercise works for you. Lifting weights versus cardio machine. You want to know the answer? If you have 30 minutes, what are you going to do? Lifting weights. weights. Thank you. Lifting weights. Dr. Gabrielle Leon, I mentioned before, has great information on the muscles of organ long longevity. Ben Bigman talks about that in his book if you've read it. Really important part, not just do cardio 30 minutes, you're going to get way more results from strength training and then moving more throughout the day. And that is a whole other movement or element in my program is movement. Exercise is one thing, but moving throughout the day is another part. So strength training. I like to say keep it simple, don't make it complicated. Like lift heavy things. We bought this house with an acre property that's up a hill with 32 stairs. As a huge garden. I got my workout during COVID lifting bags up the hill of DG, granite, dirt. We have to get up there to do the garden. So, do the stuff you like, but briefly, you know, functional strength training, a push, pull, squat, lunge, bend, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot of that this week if you want more. So, when is the best time to exercise? There's a whole thing of best time of day, like two o'clock to about five o'clock. Don't exercise too close to bed. But the best time is when you are going to do it consistently, right? So same thing, what exercise do you like to do that makes you feel good, but doing it consistently that you're creating one of those new habits, tiny habits, something I'm going to do. And it doesn't have to be long. It could be five minutes, it's a little something. So again, don't make it complicated. Oh, there's my DG bag. I carried those up, 32 of them. We had three pallets I had to do, and my husband. But, you know, doing what you like. So figure out what type of exercise you like. Do you like yoga? Do you like CrossFit? Do you like the group aerobics class, aqua aerobics? Some like any strengthening in there. So that's something to look at. And we, we're a bunch of us here, we can help you figure that out. So longevity tips. As I said, I work part-time for Ben Greenfield. And we coach our clients. What you want to do to burn fat, not just work on nutrition. Get up in the morning. What's the first thing you're going to do? Get your coffee, black. <laughs> go for a morning fasted walk outside. Again, movement's a different section, but I want to tie that in. Cold shower, you don't have to jump in a frozen lake, but having a hot, cold shower interval is the best thing for longevity. You're, you're stacking those things. Fasting, a morning walk, out sunlight, cold shower, that's going to help you with longevity, as well as I throw in some essential amino acids, which has many other benefits there. Okay, fasted exercise I'm not going to get into. If you want to come to KetoCon this July, I'll be speaking about exercise and keto. So I won't go into that, but it is in your slide. All right, who prioritizes their sleep? As I see you yawning over there. So if you've had adrenal exhaustion, so-called HPA axis dysfunction, as I did starting 2013, sleep is a, a big priority. Sleep, when you're waking up at 2 in the morning, you can't fall back to sleep, your mind's turned on. Anyone struggle with that? Yeah. 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 Red flag. Red flag, red flag, when you can't sleep. This is a, a chart. If ideally, a physical repair, about 11 to 2 a.m., physiological, psychological repair, 2 to 6 a.m. I prioritize sleep for sure. No one messes with my sleep. You won't see me out at the show's night. If I don't get my sleep, I'm a grumpy person. And there's certain times today I feel better in the morning. And some people, I've always been an early morning person. I was a friend as kids sleeping over friends' houses. I'd be hanging out with their mom because they'd still be asleep in bed till 11. I'd be like 6 a.m. wide awake, ready to go. There is a different type of skip over this, chronotype. This Dr. Bruce has written great books and speaks a lot. He writes a lot of different magazines on sleep. Have you ever heard of chronotype? If you're a lion, a bear, wolf, or dolphin. I wrote it all out in my slides that are in the ebook because I just kept the one that I am, a lion. You can take a quiz. You do have to give your email to do it. But it's a great information to figure out, maybe you're not best at 6 in the morning, maybe your best time to do this or that to exercise, to work, to focus on writing, whatever it is, 
there's different times of the day that you might perform your best. So for me, I'm an early riser, the morning time, get outside, I wake up outside in the morning, I'll wake up, work out, and then that's working. Afternoon, evening, I do not operate. Working, so that my brain turns off. So everyone's different. So ways to optimize your sleep, avoiding any intense exercise at night. I tell my clients, kitchen closed, after dinner, you know, stop eating three hours before bed, Ideally, you're in bed by 10. I go to bed at 8. Usually, I start getting ready for bed, though, an hour before that. I start I have a little routine. I'm trying to do some yin yoga, at least five minutes of stretching. Put my yoga mat right by my bed. First, I wash my face, brush my teeth, do all that stuff. I do my yoga, and then I roll into bed. So I have my pajamas on. And then I have a time to write in journal. Gratitude, eighth element is happiness, gratitude. So I write in a journal at night. Some people do better in the morning writing. Once I'm up in the morning, I'm out of bed. Writing a journal, three things I'm grateful for, and then reading in my book. Not using computer in bed. You want to keep your bed just for sleep and other activities. <laughs> uh, but you shouldn't watch TV in your bedroom. You shouldn't work in your bedroom. Your bedroom is just a sanctuary. Not being on your phone. I don't have any alerts, notifications, sounds, buzzers on my phone or my computer. They're distractions to me. I do not do well with that. That will just squirrel all the time. So, you know, not having all those devices, knowing you map in your room, there's lots more I can go into, but I wear my eye mask at night. That's not me, but I do have an eye mask. I brought it with me. I don't like bright lights, so keeping it dark. One little tip to finish with, sleep on glucose research. If you wear your Nutrisense or CGM at night, track what it is at night. It's really interesting. The graph on the left, if you have a high spike in your glucose, often it's liver time, 2 a.m., can be related to stuff going on as pathogens as well as other stressors in your body. But that's interesting, and Chinese medicine is that chart on the left, but the information on the right talks about lack of sleep with diabetes and blood sugar. So sleeping can increase insulin, partial sleeping can increase insulin resistance and lower your blood sugar. Or, sorry, so they're wrong, increase blood sugar. Stress management, another whole hour seminar. There is good stress and bad stress. Short dose of stress, and then there's distress, chronic stress. So we want stress. There's this chart, if you go back, start up here, there's you know, inactive, laid back, you're too low of stress. And then there's optimum stress, too much stress. And then the red level where I got to in 2013, burnout, breakdown, anxiety. You want the right amount of stress. So you stress, you get an acute dose. Like think, I would think of the water faucet, turn it on, turn it off. Not constant drip that's chronic. So I call it the Goldilocks effect. Not too much, not too little, just that right amount. And that's going to be different for everybody, how much you can tolerate. And there's some genetic influence to that. I obviously couldn't tolerate a lot of stress when I was doing Ironman at a high level, running my own business. I was in Bellevue, Washington, Seattle, running my own fitness studio, and had a lot of high rent and stress at owning my own business and training, exercising, all that was the over pill of stress for me. That hormesis, I mentioned it before. Has anyone heard of that word, hormetic stressors? Hot, cold, fasting, feasting, hit training. Those are all different types of hormetic stressors. A good amount of stress is acute. But the dose is the poison. Too much of anything will cause breakdown and imbalance. So we want to have that right amount. Exercising too much, hit training too much. If you're fasting too long and finding that's a stress for a lot of people, that have stress already, they shouldn't do extended fast. So figure out what works for you. So the Goldilocks principle is actually, has some research on it. It wasn't just me making it up. <laughs> and there's also the stress teeter-totter that Paul Check that I have done his training is just your hormones. And that kind of leads me to the metabolic chaos that happened to me, that happens to a lot of people, excessive stress hormones, safety, security, Food stressors, love, sex issues, toxic environment, sinking, sinking, and exercise are part of the external 
stressors that can cause imbalances to our hormones, but also we've got our hormones depressed. Melatonin, the cortisol rhythm is off balance, growth hormone of DHEA. So you get this whole downhill spiral. So there's different stressors. They come in different forms. And too much of anything can lead to metabolic chaos. And that's what we work on as FDN practitioners, which is a really long word, functional diagnostic nutrition practitioners. We work on resolving metabolic chaos by doing functional lab testing, investigating what's going on, why are all these problems happening to you, and let's figure out how you can be your best self. A couple things on stress. Gut health, this impacts your gut health, and how your microbiome in chronic stress are impacted, and how meditation can help regulate the stress response, lowering chronic inflammation, maintaining healthy gut barrier function, just by meditating, relaxing, breathing, being more parasympathetic, and not being stuck in sympathetic dominance, fight or flight. So some tips. Identify your external stressors, your energy robbers, those toxic people, those things that stress you out, like me, buzzers, phones, alerts on my computer or phone when I'm trying to work. Create some tiny habits. Hydration is a big part, eating and, eating and drinking the right foods for you. I did some vibrant wellness food zoomers in August, and I am highly reactive to anything a week, which is why I think I got sick yesterday, because there's something in the scrambled eggs. But... So if you're food sensitivities, watch what you're eating. But knowing what you're eating is another stressor if you're eating foods that you don't know or causing reactive, reacting your immune system. Uh, staying hydrating enough that, you know, we've got some mineral drops, the LMT. I like to use the unsweetened kind, but the, keeping hydrated is a huge thing and exercising. So all these things are all part of the eight elements. So the eight elements of the holistic method impact each other. So what can you do? Stress management techniques, I wrote some things out. But it's something I think everyone can do. Walking outside, in your backyard, on the grass, barefoot. Simple thing you can do, five, 10 minutes each day. Luckily we moved close to the beach, I can go walk in the sand a few days a week. But walking, the amazing research, if you look at grounding and earthing, how that you're kind of recharging your batteries. Think of a battery, especially if you've been in an airplane, first thing you want to do when you get on land, take your shoes off and walk on earth, walk on the grass if you can. So that's the easy thing. What's another thing you can do? Breathing. Everyone watch Sesame Street growing up? Why well, have only a bird there? I always thought of this when I started learning how important the breathing exercises and think Bert and Ernie County Sheep. So I looked up there's a video on YouTube about Bert and Ernie breathing exercises. But breathing is so simple. We have to do it or we want to be here. So box breathing. Try it right now. Box breathing. Is this something I do when I can't sleep at night or when I'm trying to fall asleep? Or when you're stressed out, you need to chill out a little bit. Box breathing. You breathe in through your nose, four counts. You hold your breath four seconds. You're making a box. Exhale through your mouth for four. Exhale another four counts. You do that over and over again until you relax, and it actually puts me back to sleep. So that's a great trick. Four, seven, eight breathing. Has anyone heard of this one? So it's another popular one. So you inhale, count to four, hold for the count of seven, and don't hold that long if you're not used to it. <laughs> you may work up to it. And then exhale through your mouth, making a wishing sound for the count of eight. And you repeat. Those are two little things you can do, actually three with the walking, and you can stack them together. Walking in your yard, focusing on nasal breathing. And does anyone sleep with their mouth open, mouth breathers? Yeah, so you can get actually tape, mouth tape, that you can do, but teach yourself how to not breathe through your mouth is a hard thing. Wim Hof breathing is really popular, but that's more energizing. It's something to do in the morning or if you're Stacking that with cold shower, that might be good, or some exercise, but that's another trick. And then cryotherapy, a good way to start on cold showers is to do what I do is here when I moved to California because I like the warm weather. 20 seconds on, off. 
So it's kind of like a Tabata timer that we do in workouts. It's 20 seconds all out of something. In the shower, you do 20 seconds all out cold. Hot, cold, hot, cold. Or you can have um, a lake if you live by a lake. Or if you want to go all out, you get a $10,000 tub that's cold called the fridges you can buy. Or you can make a freezer into a cold tub. So some other tips that you can do. I like using adaptogens. Mushroom adaptogens are really easy to use. Tea, like a reishi tea that's calm, relaxing. Um, little CBD, magnesium at night. There's different things I like. There's adrenal oils that my friend Vibrant Blue Oil sells. There's a parasympathetic oil. There's different things, and there's lots out there, but that's working with the coach, figure out what works best for you is going to be different than someone else, so figuring out. Then again, fasting. I, can, I find it being a stressor. I'm a big faster. I just stress my body by fasting too much. I was like, ah, oh, I can go on all day not eating anything. But there's a time and a place for it. I was doing kind of an OMAD all the time, but I was training three times a day. So it wasn't, it wasn't good for me. So make sure you're matching your exercise, your hormones for women with your nutrition and your fasting. So Dr. Mindy Pels is great on that. Okay, movement. Does anyone count their steps today? Okay. What, what's your goal for how many steps to go today? Anyone? As many as you can get, that's good. 20? Oh, 10. Good. Now, 10,000 steps, what we tell our clients to lose weight in our Van Grupo transformation program I help with is 15,000 steps. Not dollars, steps. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot. And I run, I still train for triathlons, but I don't race, but I still swim, bike, run, and lift weights and do yoga. But I'm trying to move more. So even if you go to the gym and do your 30-minute workout in the morning, as I said, I still want you to move throughout the day, right? We don't want to work out and go sit and watch TV or sit at our computer all day, and then we're looking like this shape that I see my poor father has back pain because he's got computer posture sitting at a computer for years. So we want to move more, and I think it's really important to figure out how to do that. So Ben had, if you read his book, again, great information in his book on insulin resistance and why we need to move and how that helps as well as strength training. <coughs> why to walk outside, so that stack, getting that sunshine in the morning, vitamin D, your hormones. You know your cortisol should be up in the morning, so you'll have that natural the hot little energizer, glucose will go up in your Cortisol's up in the morning, so the melatonin should go down. The melatonin should go up at nighttime, right? You want to go to sleep, and the cortisol should be going down. But we kind of reverse that with the blue light. But we want the sunshine in the morning, and that will help set that circadian rhythm. So there's good research on serotonin, melatonin, and daylight, and how to help your sleep at night doesn't just start with what you're doing right before bed. It helps how you start your day. So getting that exposure to sunlight, first thing I do after my cup of coffee, yes, I make my French press in the morning, I do go outside and exercise outside, and I like to get out at sunrise. I call it the dawn patrol. I learned that's what surfers call it in San Diego when you're first surfer out there, but I call making my own hat, the dawn patrol runners, walkers, or hiker, just get outside when the sun is rising. Early bird gets the work because it's the most beautiful thing in the morning when the sun's coming up. And I like to watch the sunset as well. So just getting outside throughout the day. So movement, you know, getting flexibility is the important part. Core, posture, alignment, and that's some good information. But what I said when COVID started is moving breakfast, lunch, dinner does not mean meal time. It means move time. So don't think is that morning breakfast that needs to eat means I need to get up and move. Lunchtime, that means, oh, I haven't gotten out yet. I need to get outside and move again. Dinner time, we'll eat and then go out and walk. So I want you to walk after your meals, even if it's out in your driveway and back, or here you can walk around the ship and back. So getting movement afterwards helps to our next topic, digestion. You know what that picture is in the back? <laughs> That's poop. So Paul Chak has a good chart. He makes poop funny because actually as a health coach, I do have to talk about people's poop because it tells you a lot about what you eat or what you don't absorb, actually. Not what you ate, but what did you absorb and how is your digestion. 
We talk about leaky gut, gut health. We want to have a, a strong gut wall lining. Again, chronic stress impacts our gut. If you exercise a lot, if you're out in the sun exercising, it will still create leaky gut. So I can be so healthy, but so unhealthy at the same time. So when we're working with clients, working north to south, how we eat, how we break down our food, chewing the food, being mindful when you eat, all impacts our gut health. So we want to have no holes in our gut. If you see on the left side, that's a good gut wall lining. We have this barrier. But then as we have these stressors, irritants, toxins, inflammatory cytokines, that's what happens, the LPS, endotoxins. So there's different signs of leaky gut that might be, you know, all brain fog. There's so many different things that can be anything, but really testing and not guessing, finding out what it is. Oops, we want that back. So there's Dr. Amy Myers has great information on gut health. She's a good person to look at. So digestion, there's all sorts of information if you want to learn more about what is a sinking stinker and all these different guys have a name in correlation to if you're not absorbing your fat. A lot of people eat a high fat diet but don't digest their fats properly. So looking at your poop, there's information on these, these all these on my slides if you want more. I think they need a website. Also gluten, I found out my food zoomer, I thought it was just gluten free, but I was getting wheat. Even in my athletic greens, wheatgrass is wheat. So learning about gluten, why it comes down to like, what the heck can I eat? That's why I see why carnivore makes sense to a lot of us when we're doing because before she gets into the official stuff, I have a song that I do with my grandchildren. And I want to participate. I'm going to point to you. And it's very simple. It's like, I'm grateful for this low-carb food. I'm grateful for this new lifestyle. I'm grateful for my wife. I'm grateful, grateful for, here we go. I'm grateful for my grandchildren. I'm grateful for. My husband, I'm grateful for. My wife, I'm grateful, grateful for. Do this with your family. It's great. We also do it. Somebody loves Debbie. Somebody loves Autumn. <laughs> anyway, it's great. It's great. Makes you feel good. That was beautiful, and I love music. I'm grateful for my beautiful husband. Thank you. I love that guy. Okay. Um, so, thank you, uh, Debbie. That was amazing. So, I was taking notes, uh, you know, when each of the speakers are speaking. Some things that just stick out to me. Um, and so, I just want to recap things. The, the highlights that I picked up from Debbie Potts. I'm just thinking about stress and sleep and all the things that affect your weight and your ability to release weight, in fact, right? Once again, we put so much emphasis on how much we're eating. We don't necessarily even think about what we're eating. And we don't think about the things that have nothing to do with eating that can affect our weight loss, right? So prioritize that sleep. I'm with you. I'm in bed by 9.15 at the latest. People know, like, they just don't call me, don't text me, don't ask me to come to your party. I'm not leaving the house after 7 p.m., right? Don't take it personally. I need my sleep. But stress, just all these things that we can do that have nothing to do with what we eat but how they affect our weight. Um, and then thinking about why we eat. Why do you eat, right? Uh, and realizing it doesn't have to be the same every time. The majority of the time we should be eating to nourish our body, right? But there are some times where we eat to celebrate. We eat to do these things. And I, I personally, I don't want to demonize those things. Like, food is fuel. No matter what, don't enjoy it. Just eat it. You know, like, we're, we're, we're not those people in this community, right? We love good tasting food, right? And so just realizing that, yes, the majority of the time food is to fuel your body and to give your body nutrients, but it's okay to celebrate. It's okay to be on vacation. It's okay to let loose in the ways that are still going to be alignment with your goals. Uh, and then finally, one of the last things on the slide was pick one thing, right? You don't have to pick all the things and start them immediately. Pick one thing and try that and do that thing until it becomes a habit. You don't have to think about it and then move on to the next thing, right? We don't have to do everything right now all the time, right? Change happens slowly. And so just doing that. And then I realized I'm a lion. I'm a lion too. I don't even know the other types of animals, but just from the list, I was like, oh, that's me. I was looking at my husband. I was like, yeah, that's 
Yeah, like that. So thank you so much, Debbie. Really appreciate it. And once again, don't forget that ebook will be coming to you. You can go to the website and download that ebook, and these slides will be coming to you as well.